This is the Tar Life Podcast from Team Anderson Realty. Thank you for joining us. This is the Tar Life Podcast. I have my co-host, Melody Tate, Jennifer Stewart, my executive assistant, as well as Austin Tate. He is the biologist and owner of Wild Science Solutions. And he's here to talk to us about the things that he removes and answer some questions that he may or may not be able to answer. So I'm really excited to talk to him. But in the meantime, we have to talk about Greece. So Jennifer and Melody went with me to Santorini, Greece, which is an amazing place to visit. And we have some funny stories and some incredible stories. We can't recommend it enough. But first, we're going to go in. We're going to start with Jennifer. What was your first impression of Santorini? And what stood out the most during the trip? Well, when we first got off of the plane and got onto a party bus, it oh, was like yeah. great. Oh, yeah. It was like, you know, the lights were yeah. going and our driver the, was like super yeah, cool. Yeah, that right. music thumping. And I was like, yeah. Wasn't this it like 12 o'clock at night or something? Yeah, yeah it, was it was. And it really set the tone. We were like, these people are so happy. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. so Everyone friendly. Was happy. Everyone was super happy. But then... It was when we woke up that we got to really see the view. Oh, oh yeah. Breath. Like, we're on the edge of a cliff yeah. overlooking the Mediterranean. In that classic white yeah. background. Yes. Like, all the buildings were white. It was absolutely phenomenal. Like, yeah, stunning. Right. The rims were great. Where do we stay? Was the Volcano Inn? Volcano yeah. View? Volcano View. Volcano Hotel. Hotel. Yeah. I felt like I was on my honeymoon with Mel. Wait, where are we? That's <laughs> true. They were roommates. Okay, we stayed in room. I <laughs> love that. So, Mal, what was your first impression, and what is your most memorable moment during that part of the trip? Mm, it was just really pretty. It was just gorgeous. Was it more pre- picturesque than you were thinking it would oh, be? Yeah, yeah. It was breathtaking. I mean, it's it, like spoke to my soul. So it was like I can live, live here. I'm like I want to go back already. It, it was just great. I think the most memorable was probably definitely the hike that we <laughs> went on. Oh, yeah. And all the food. I mean, all the mm-hmm. food was super mm-hmm. yummy. It, it was. And yeah. you were really adventurous on this trip. And oh, Santorini yeah. had probably, you had some octopus, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She Lots really of went out things. of her element, yeah. which was surprising. She was like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, come on, went in Rome. Yeah, it was great. And lots of good wine. We went to, the, oh, yeah, we did go on that winery tour. Oh, that was nice. That yeah. Was I got a little wine wasted on a boat. I love it. I forgot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we turned into yeah. an amazing photographer when she had two <laughs> Santorini oh, yeah. wine, wine. Oh, yeah. We started looking real good. No. <laughs> time in my life. She's like, you look great. And it's like, you guys look amazing. They did Wait, not I'll show you these pictures, and we're that, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, living the life. That was really fun. But the snorkeling, that catamaran. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, Chat that, that was. One. Was like your first snorkeling experience. Oh yeah, and the water was freezing. I remember how cold it was. Oh, yeah. but how clear was it? So Vivian, yeah. our family friend, was feeding fish off the boat. So I'd be snorkeling around, and I was like, "Wow, there's a school of fish everywhere." And then I realized that she's thr- oh, she's she like was? chumming the waters. Yeah, I did not know yeah. that. Yes. I thought it was a she little was like, abnormal that they were so out. close oh, to me. It was super cool. Yeah. yeah, I was like, "It's my time to get out now." Yeah, you know, you did a really great job, though, because mm-hmm. it's intimidating to get on a catamaran, go mm-hmm. into the middle of the ocean and snorkel for the first time. Jennifer's first time was at the Frying Pan Tower. Yeah, yeah. that's intimidating. You're like, I almost died there. Yeah, yeah. I like, was like international watching sharks waters. on the camera right before I dropped 80 feet down into the water, mm-hmm. 32 miles out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> He yeah, was like, I don't like, know if swim. I can do this. Just swim away. Like, we got this. She's like, but I've never the snorkeled waves before. The crashing yeah. on you. I was like, but can you it swim? Because like that's all that really matters. Swells. Right? Mm-mm. If I'm you there. can swim, you can snorkel. I, can I can't. I can't swim. I mean, I have to hold my nose. You need yes, to be a scuba nice. diver. Oh, we need to get you on. certified. I mean, yeah. yeah. The whole goggle thing. Would you works. consider getting certified with Jennifer? Yes. Yeah. 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 Jump out of the plane, Mel. Exactly. <laughs> See, you're <laughs> fine. Like, honestly, <laughs> if you do, like, nothing crazy, like, you don't go past 100 feet and you stay in shallow diving, like, 40, 50 feet, and you have a mask so you don't feel like, and you're breathing with your regulator and you have a spare, it's called your secondary, 
It's fine. really, it is. It's just really fine. <laughs> I feel like I feel like if you can skydive and you snorkeled in Santorini, no, yeah, I would, I would skydive again. You have a BC work. though that like puts the air in if you need it, and you have like so you can sink or you can float. So I'm sinking. Yes. No, but see, I think you'd be. I really think you should consider that because she needs should. to get certified anyways, yeah. and I would love to have my daughter get certified as well oh yeah that would be fun yeah so you guys could do the class together love that for her yeah (laughs) and i have all the gear you could practice yeah maybe we'll see but santorini we're gonna make her it sounds like a good idea doesn't it are you certified i am oh my gosh that's right yeah Yeah. when you got certified did they make you pull your mask off with the yeah Yeah. i feel like that'd be her biggest struggle because it's like some people like that's their like break it line is if they can breathe through their mouth without breathing through their nose i can't do that i'm not that so, yeah, so it it's is practice. intimidating because you can't. And I, when I got certified, I was 13. And so these seas were really rough. Yeah. And so visibility was greatly reduced. My mom was throwing up on the side of the boat. Huh. And I was just like, yeah, four or five foot seas. I guess this is normal. Like, I don't know. So I jumped over and I did it. And it was definitely like one of those. I felt comfortable because my instructor was so good. But you have to take your mask off breathe then you you quickly put it back on though they don't tell you to like swing it around and wait for five minutes and then you put it on you partially lift it you blow air bubbles in to clear it yeah but in theory you could open your eyes and i have and in never the in the i have water. i have never without a mask wow. it is very hard to do to actually swim around with your eyes open and it's blurry and breathe out of the regulator yeah. That was a feat in and of itself. And I would I really wouldn't recommend it. But before Austin was what he did, he was actually a diver. I wasn't a diver. Oh, right. um, yeah. I worked for a sonar research company and we did some diving with that. Yeah. Honestly, most of it was just like cleaning the barnacles off the boat and stuff. But like visibility was like none. See, so. that's why, you know, bull sharks, they if you like scuba dive in brackish water, which is like the intercoastal. Anywhere that there's low visibility, a lot of times bull sharks will be, and they like to attack from underneath. Great. So, yeah, you wouldn't see them coming. Like some of the sharks, they like to do a, like a, they circle around something that they're interested in or they might potentially attack. But with bull sharks, you just get bam, you know, you just Great. get surprise. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that would worry me. So, my one of my first open water dives. When we were diving, we dove the Liberty ship in Wilmington and there was like about a nine foot bull shark just oh. kind of sitting at the surface. Yeah. And he was ignoring us, but somebody decided to gig a flounder. Yeah. And while we were all diving, so he started moving around a good mm-hmm. bit after that because obviously mm-hmm. there was blood in the water. Um, so when we come up to the boat, we're all waiting on the line, you know, doing our time up. Yeah. Was it like 15 feet. And uh, seas were pretty rough. And right when I come to the surface, you know, boats bouncing up and down i feel something grab my leg yeah was it your friend and i'm like what is going on don't freak out you yeah. know and it, it grabs my leg again and i reached down and grabbed this kid and he had come up the line too soon and he was underneath the boat and the boat was slamming on his head no. he, had, he had busted his nose and everything but i freaked out thinking that shark was like messing with you're me. like why can't i feel this oh, yeah. no. i've been bit sh- uh, surfing by like wasn't a shark but by like some type of fish. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have a wetsuit on, you don't really realize yeah. it until you take your wetsuit off and you have, you know, a little blood mark and teeth marks. See, in it. I feel like that might have been a shark. I've tried to. Hey, let me just say, like, I tried really to get through. What was a three millimeter, five millimeter? Yeah, no, most likely it was like a blue fish or something like that. You could see the shape. I have of the never, mouth. I've never had a fish bite me scuba diving. So I just want to preface this, like, so that would terrify me. I feel like you're. For me, surf, well, I surf, surfing, you look like Yeah, well, I surfed also every day, so the incident is going to be more likely. But also, you're splashing at the surface. Yeah. I don't know if you feel like this, but whenever I'm scuba diving, like, the fish just think you're another fish. They'll they come do. right up to you and yeah. look at you, and, like, to the point where sometimes I had to, like, smack them away with my snorkel. You know they're sentient beings? Did you know that? Yeah, that they have done that. research that fish and lobsters and crabs are all sentient? Mm-hmm. And I totally have always believed that, but the, they've done some research studies that they actually have more of a depth in terms of like the capacity to be aware of their surroundings and feel pain and be Sadness. cognizant. Yeah. So I've always emotions. been fascinated since I read that. And so I, I could never spearfish because, and there are a lot of people I know that do it and I have no problem with it. It's just like hunting. If you're going to eat no and you're not eating. killing just for, 
you know, you're not killing just to kill. Yeah. But anyways, let's dive right into what Austin Tate does and his company. We are going to just ask you questions like a typical consumer would because as real estate agents and in the real estate field, we have utilized your services and other companies that have done this type of thing, but we don't necessarily have direct experience as a homeowner with the the, the array of things that you've worked with. So first of all, let's start with what type of animals or wildlife do you usually or what can you can you address? Sure, sure, absolutely. So yes, my licensing for the company is for wildlife. That includes most things. So anything that falls under a pest animal. So obviously you have your insects fall under pest control. Rats and mice fall under pest control, the way you address those. And we don't deal with game animals. That falls under the Wildlife Resource Commission specifically. So with the game animal. Uh, deer, a turkey, boar. bear, things like that. Okay. So we're looking at nuisance wildlife. Raccoons, snakes, bats, squirrels, possums. Chipmunks. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> the chipmunks as you get farther north in Raleigh, groundhogs. I'm surprised that mice don't fall under like chipmunks and squirrels because they seem more directly related than it, boars and bears. And Yeah, so it's it's more in how it's the problem's treated than what the actual animal species is. So usually with mice and rats, those type of rodents, they're so prolific that there needs to be some type of baiting or population control. And all those chemicals are regulated through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That makes sense. Versus my licensing through the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. So it's that more on, as I assess that problem, my license for that is to assess that, hey, this animal is here, not supposed to be here. It's doing damage to the home up to this amount or a significant enough amount of damage that that animal needs to be removed in some cases. Most of the time, we can get around that. That's what that permit allows me to write. It's called a depredation permit. So if you go to a home, you arrive and you find that there's a, an animal that you cannot treat, do you have like recommended vendors for people that you have kind of co-worked with or pest control companies that can help mitigate the problem? Absolutely. Here recently with the temperatures dropping, I feel like half my calls lately have been for mice and people don't realize how loud mice can be. Oh, God, um, can usually imagine. on the phone, I can already get an idea of what it's going to be. But so if I show up and it's mice, they, they thought they had squirrels, but it's mice. NC Pest Control out of Fuquay has been my number one referral for that. So, okay. you know, as far as just finding good local companies that do handle that type of thing that are reputable and treat their customers the same way I do. I always look for that. What is the weirdest thing or story that you've had uh, re regarding any type of animal? So I feel like everybody asks me that and it's. I've been doing it so long. It's always usually the same species. So I'm I'm not terribly surprised by what type of animal it is. Some of the people I meet are like, to me, like surprise me the most. Sometimes I'm just completely caught off guard. You know, I've had customers run outside as I pull up shirtless, telling me to shoot the bats. That are <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, this is going to be an interesting call. I feel like it? you're so calm though, that like you can handle any odd situation. Where, you know, the person's acting irrationally, but you're like, I've got this under control. Yeah, well, it's, it's I'm not I'm unfazed your, by your yeah. shirtless body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not irrational to them because it's their first time dealing with it. Right. But it's another Tuesday for me. So it ends up, you know, kind of like, okay, we'll get this under control. Do we have any fruit bats or is it mostly the ones that look like little... So the bats that yeah, I see like getting into attics... Yeah, uh, <laughs> blood suckers. I mean, they look like it because they have those little pig noses. Yeah, I mean, if you look at them close, they look like little puppies, to be honest with you. They're no. cute. Yeah. No, but I mean, I like bats. Yeah. But the ones that have the fruit bats are the cutest. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, those are. really look like puppies. Yeah. I we think, don't have those here. No. So the most common species I see getting into addicts are brown bats. So you have little brown and big brown bats. Those are make up the majority of what I do. Are those the ones that have the little piggy noses? Sort of, yeah. Okay. Might be thinking of a different species. I, I picked one up at one of my listings that was having a, well, I got it out of the way because it was like falling down the stairs. And so I, I was like, okay, they have a bat problem, but he was kind of like large. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe like 
four or five inches and I just set him to the side. Yes, I probably, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably yes. I actually relocated him outside, but I don't know if I was supposed to do that. But yeah. he was just like, he was, he wasn't in, he was in the main house mm -hmm. and I just, I didn't want people, they were terrified. I didn't want them to kill it. And obviously it's protected, but yep. like, is it okay that I like moved You probably it? shouldn't have touched it. Well, I didn't physically, I had a blanket gotcha. between me and the bat. Yeah. Yeah. So just a side note off that, that's usually like the most frustrating thing for me to hear. And it causes a lot of, not what you did, yeah. but so I get calls often that I woke up and there was a bat in my room. I either open a window or a door and shoot it out. Usually that's going to involve possibly getting some rabies shots for the customer. If you do ever have a bat. But only if they've bitten you though, right? Or you've. If you've made contact with it. So if you're sleeping and the bat was in the room with you. Hi, oh, come on. So it's. Don't it's, take my advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like pick Austin's advice, but I am not like I would rather risk having some rabies. Like if it bit me, though, I would absolutely get all that you can tell. Right. It's a very low probability, high risk situation. So, mm -hmm. you know, when people think of rabies, they usually think of like, oh, you know, rabid fox or raccoons mouth and they the honestly mouth. most of your species that carry rabies it's about the same and like you know so usually on a yearly basis they take test between like one and a half to three percent of those species which some people are think like one and a half to three percent have rabies but it's the tested animals that come back that so in order Can to you test, carry rabies and not have rabies as a bat so or would they actively have rabies there's a you know obviously a a gestation period that's not the word i'm looking for but there's a period of time you know where that virus is like any other virus asymptomatic yes where you can pass it but you haven't had the symptoms yet okay but um, they can't get away from that at some point they're going to have active symptoms yes they do have rabies rabies it's not like they're carrying some sort of virus that is dormant and somehow being around somebody if they don't bite the person can shed it I won't get too far into it because I'm not an expert on the situation, but there are animals that can't, haven't had any cases of spreading rabies. Like possums? So is that one of them? Or possums are one of them. Possums' body temperatures stay too low. They don't effectively carry the virus. There's no, last time I, you know, did my coursework on it, mm. there was no uh, signs of possums ever spreading rabies. And some people are like, oh, what if they're running a fever? You know, um, their body temperature could get high enough. Like, you know, there's okay. all these hypotheticals. I believe squirrels are the same situation. And I hear mixed things about that sometimes when people get bit by squirrels. Oh, I got bit by a squirrel that I had rescued when I was a minor so in Florida. So it probably wasn't really. But I mean, I we let him go. Yeah. Like he was like injured and stuff. I didn't like keep him. Yeah. But he got his little testicles dropped and he turned into a yeah. man. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, we put his little cage out. We did a soft release and everything was great until he attacked my boyfriend at the time and he grabbed his neck. And my boyfriend was like, <laughs> and then he jumped onto me, little, his name was Alvin, bit to Coming my in. bone <laughs> on my finger and I flung him on the ground. And then I ran inside the house and I think like the next week, he attacked our neighborhood, <laughs> no, but he was like friendly and he wasn't like this vicious squirrel, but he was not, he was being territorial and we didn't mm -hmm. tell our neighbor that we had this pet squirrel that we just stopped releasing. <laughs> so he jumped on him and he was like, ah, oh, right. the squirrel just like, <laughs> and it talked to me. But I was like, I'm glad that you said that because I was like, well, Alvin bit me, but, you know, I knew him intimately and I never hung out with him again because I was like, <laughs> we're done here. I heard his little barking and I was like, I know what you're thinking. Mm. You're not going to bite me again. We're done. Just got a little too familiar. Oh, <laughs> we get territorial, but I'm glad that you said that they really are unlikely. Yeah, I don't. as far as I know, there's not been any cases of squirrels spreading that, but I have heard of people getting rabies shots after being bitten by squirrels. Like, I'm just going to risk it. Now, if my kids got bit, okay, like, I get yeah. it. But, like, for me, I'm like, no. Like, if I know the squirrel, it's like my dog. If my dog didn't have his rabies shot and he bit me, I would not. I would not be getting that shot. But, like, I'm a high-risk person, I guess, in my life. I, yes. I mean, is it illegal that I didn't touch it, but I moved it outside into the yard because it was in the middle of like a traffic 
area. Yeah, so once they're in the living space, like yeah, if, it was they, not if, the they, attic. If, they, if they're just in the attic or in like a wall void or not in the actual living space, okay. you, you can move those like bats or have animal right? control or okay. a wildlife company remove that. Yes. Because I was just like, I was literally in their like staircase in the living area of the house. And I was like, I don't know what to do, but obviously I didn't want it to bite me. And so I wrapped it in this, my jacket. And I brought it outside. But somebody told me that if you do that, like they don't really fly from the ground. So I, they probably needed to climb up a tree because they drop down to fly. They, they do. But I have seen them like they can kind of hop if they, if they have enough energy left. I've seen that happen before. You know, they'll take their wings and lift themselves I mean, up I put the on like a bush. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, if he, if he was healthy still, he, he it's not healthy. like he's going to just die on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. He seemed pretty good. Yeah. But back to my original point, like just... As far as the rabies thing, it's unfortunately the one or two deaths on average we have in the U.S. a year. Usually, One or two, that's it? It's pretty low. It's pretty low on average. It's usually from oh, an accidental goodness. bat exposure. Somebody wakes up in the morning, um, sees a dead bat on the floor, or shakes one out of their sheets, and they're like, oh, that's gross, that weird. Sheets. Now that. Or, or there was Burn one in the room, down. and they just, yeah. you know, in the room Did in the morning. Did it bite them? So... Bats have really tiny teeth, especially the smaller They're bats. Like spiders, hmm. where you can't feel them necessarily. It could be possible, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they end up, you know, either shooing the bat out the window or something like that, or throwing it in the trash if it's dead. And you know, six months to a year later, they're dead from rabies. That's usually the scenario. So it's okay, like okay. I said, it's not it's not that bats carry rabies more than anything else. It's just if you were bitten by a raccoon, you're going to go get your rabies shots, right. you know. But yeah. people don't yeah. really know that they had exposure. There was a article in one of the major new newspapers like new york times or something where somebody was doing either a triathlon or a marathon or, or some some type of biking event and a bat hit them in the chest while they were riding their bike and they talked through the whole process on getting the rabies shots it was it was interesting the rabies shots are expensive i've had some customers that end up spending like fourteen thousand dollars by the time the whole process is, is done so really, the point there is if you do have Don't a bat in the house, the with you, yeah, Erica. <laughs> if I'm gonna save, I'm gonna save the life. Well, now of an you know animal. who to call if yeah. you've got bat problems. I guess that we can, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, or snakes or now. Whatever have else. you ever had to like take an animal that was rabid and do you test them or anything? So I've taken animals to be tested before. Usually, I'll have them call animal control. The process is a lot smoother. So. They're able to, to take the animal and, and take it to get tested. Just imagine Austin being like, I need to get this call. Somebody thinks that this animal is rabid. It's, yeah. it's not usually that case. It's the the bat scenario. So if, if they woke up with a bat in the house and I come out there, that way, instead of them having to get rabies shots oh, for possible exposure, animal. send it off to get tested. The only sad thing is they probably, they have to kill the animal. They do have to use the test. Test. Yeah, they have yeah. to dissect the brain. So that's that was my point about the percentage of animals being tested, like, it has to warrant whatever behavior that animal's displaying has to warrant actually dissecting their brain to test it. So realistically, the number of animals that actually have rabies is much lower than, you know, one and a half to three percent. But there had to be cause for that animal to test it in the first place. So it's a, you know, raccoon acting weird, you know, the typical foaming from the mouth. And also another point is if you see raccoons during the day or even foxes during the day, people think that they're rabid automatically. And that's not the case. Those animals still forage during the day, even though they are mostly nocturnal, which raccoons are, they are mostly active at night, but not fully nocturnal. So people, I get that call all the time. They'll see an animal going through their yard and same thing with that damage control permit. Like you have a raccoon getting in your trash. That's not, that doesn't warrant me coming out and doing, removing like that animal. Put your trash yeah, somewhere exactly. Where the Lock your trash. You know, I can it. always advise people on things they can do, but if you just, you know, have an animal going through your yard or something digging through your open trash like that's that doesn't warrant um getting rid of the animal that's more of a you know locking down you have to share the earth guys yeah Yeah. (laughs) so jennifer had a really interesting question that i think i'm ready for you to ask because which one are you referring to so you were talking about like if he has any ideas about your herd that you have in your (laughs) house well i think he kind of just touched on that a little bit I have, I'm out a little further in the country. And uh, was it the herd last night? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I question is instead of calling animal control, is there a deterrent? 
Yeah, so there I have about five feral cats that I like to just throw She's down. She's a crazy on my cat lady. She just doesn't know it. She's like, I just pulled up and there's a party going on in my yeah, porch. And were, I just start sending her all these random pictures yeah. of cats. So what would you recommend? Like, do I need to call animal control? Like, do, do you I like mothballs like work for you? cats? I, or yeah, is that I, like you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it any wise tale? Yeah, so almost every house I go to usually has mothballs, noisemakers, like lights, owls, Isn't everything. Isn't there like a urine that you can put down that like deters yeah. some sort of on, animal? On some certain species. It just depends on the biggest thing with most animals when you're looking for is, okay, what's the food source? What's their reason for being So why there? do you think she's got five wild cats that showed up on her doorstep? Well, if you're the only structure in a large she's plot not. of land, you know, you've got, she's not. you've got shelter there, you know, your porch, things like that. And yeah. then once, once they start breeding there and establishing yeah. that area. Their so, home. Yeah. And her Jack Russell <laughs> is, is my not liking it. No, not at all. Yeah. I did not get that much sleep last night. Oh, no. <laughs> That's that's one thing I don't deal with is feral cats because it is it's really messy. It's not good PR. It's you know like their own cats because around once a cat yeah. becomes feral, it's treated like any other rabies vector. You can't relocate it. That makes sense. And feral, a lot of people throw that term around. There's a difference between stray and feral. feral. In theory, could you catch a cat? Like, is that within your license? Even if you don't, want it is it? in my license, but I can't relocate it. So that's why I don't oh, mess with that. You, you know, feel and, really bad. Yeah, exactly. And again, so feral cats have to be multiple generations of wild versus just being stray cats. So I've gotten these calls before. Where it's like, oh, I've got feral cats underneath my house. And I'm like, these are kittens. And the mom has a collar. These aren't feral. You know, like it's just, oh, I'm not. The cat you didn't yeah. want to play to destroy were born these and kittens. In the woods. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I prefer to leave that up to animal control. Mm -hmm. That's not something I really want to deal with. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't want that blood on his hands. Oh, no, I no. want to hear the craziest snake story. Yeah, so <laughs> I never really got into the. Uh, so yeah, the biggest thing, like I said, it's usually local species, but it's where the where they get sometimes. So I've gotten one call where the lady woke up, put her hand underneath her pillow, and there was a snake underneath her pillow. <laughs> a big one. <laughs> It was about like a four and a half foot long oh, black snake. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. At least it was a black snake. It's usually. Did it want to bite her or was it no, like sweet? No, no. So what was, what was happening <laughs> is she had a really bad mouse problem. Again, we go back to that food source. It's snakes oh, yeah. especially. Yep. Like everybody, you know, if you're buying like snake deterrents, things like that, they don't care. Did some snakes go under your house? They're very primitive. They're just looking for, you know, the amount of moisture they need. Biggest thing is their food source. So wherever their food is, they're going to go. Rat snakes, most commonly, even though it's a six foot rat snake, you see how small their head is. They can fit this through the same size holes as mice can. What kind of holes would that mm. kind of snake go through your air vent? Like a hole in your. It's really anything a mouse can get through. So it's, um, you know, cracks around the crawl space door. Or yeah. Holes, you know, where the plumbing for the dishwasher or the electrical for the dishwasher, things like that come in. You know, Biggest thing that I usually see is where they, you know, drilled a hole this big for a wire that big that aren't sealed. Better get some spray foam, guys. Yeah. yeah. Seal up those gaps. Yeah, just be careful with the yellow spray foam because it actually has a salt content to it and oh. it, the mice actually like eating it. <laughs> so, <laughs> interesting. So, so the new construction that the builders are using, is that something that they're just putting down for future mouse? Usually, food? I mean, usually they're using the... the Pink. The spray, the spray foam, I mean, both of those, like I said, have a salt content to it. It's more for insulation purposes. So they're insulating around the pipes, making sure you don't get drafts, things like that around there. So it's not so much. And it will help with insects as well. But what did she do? So the woman that had the snake under her pillow, like, what do you do when you're half asleep and you feel a snake Oh, she under freaked there? out and called me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come get the snake. Yeah. So I came like, out. What time was it when this occurred? It was when she woke up in the morning. And she was really far out in the country. She snuggled with that all night long. But all so night. I checked and she had mice living in her dresser drawers. How did she not notice that? She did. But, you know, some people have a, a different, you know, especially if you grow up. She didn't mind the mice, but she really did not like that snake. No. I didn't realize that the, though, that the. Yeah, I mean, they're the, not paying much attention mm -hmm. to it. Like, you know, and it's just. Especially people, you know, if, if you live out in the country and you're, oh, mice, you know, it's just my something dad that happens. Had mice get in his garage because oh, my man. stepmother had bird, bird seed, seed. Oh, yeah. and it went into his Porsche and it made nests. They made nests and they tore up his wiring harness and they clogged his drain plugs. Didn't you have that before in your Corvette too? Mice had gotten in there, but it was being kept outside. 
Yeah, when yeah. when I was storing it behind our barn under the lean to. Yeah, it's for one, like you said, bird seed. Ooh. Be careful with bird seed and pet food. And with bird feeders, try to try to get the least amount of mess, most efficiently way to feed the birds. I don't like sunflower seeds, to be honest with you. Like most people that have squirrel issues, that if they feed the bird, I see really those sunflower seeds in the attic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the pre-shelled stuff, they have the kind of a spicy bird seed that, you know, animals won't necessarily like to eat. But a sunflower seed is recognizable to a lot of species of animal. It's a high energy source. Wow. So, I um, know that. so don't grow sunflowers in your yard, too? I mean, sunflowers themselves aren't going to produce nearly as many seeds as you filling up a feeder straight full of Oh, yeah, those so, sunflowers. No, but they big. do some, have a lot of seeds that would yeah, dry up. Yeah, but in, also that's a short amount of period versus somebody feeding year round. Oh, yeah, that's a good um, point. So I would keep the feeders, you know, not too close to the house, farther out in the yard. Um, but I do like, you know, try to make it so that the wildlife can't get to What's it. What's the average cost for squirrel removal and bat removal? And I mean, give me like a low cost case and a high cost case just rough idea sure sure let me explain the work first just so you have a better understanding of what that cost entails our biggest focus is not so much just removing the animal but sealing the house up so they don't have that issue again you know it does us no Going good to the source yeah to the source. <laughs> <laughs> it does us no good for instance i'm getting squirrel calls right now it does me no good just to remove the squirrels there for one you know Obviously, we're... It'll be an ongoing issue. Yeah, we're removing the squirrels. And then in the spring, usually they have a litter in the spring and the fall. So they're going to be back during that time period to get ready to have their babies. I'm not removing every squirrel in your neighborhood. You know, I'm just yeah. getting the ones that are currently they're targeting so your cute. house. I'm glad. Yeah. So by that, we minimize the amount of squirrels we're actually removing from the area and giving you a long-term solution versus just a Band-Aid. So checking things like the most common entry points for... Squirrels and bats are soffit returns. So where the soffit come back and meet the shingles, usually the builder will leave a gap there. They don't always flash it. And that gives room for the roofers to put their shingles in. It also helps uh, keep that wood from drawing moisture off there. But squirrels see, you know, a half inch gap there and they feel the air temperature and the difference and they start gnawing it open. Uh. Bats only need about three eighths of an inch wow. to get in. So they're sliding under all these little tight gaps on the house. The gable vents, so the louvered triangle vents, sometimes they're round near the peaks of the roof. They go in between those louvers, they hang on the bug screen. A gable vent on a house is almost identical to how you would build like a bat house as out of hobby. So you would put, you know, some different slats in with some screen on for them to hang on to. So as we continue to develop our area, you know, bats, natural habitats or caves, which we don't really have any of. And we never had caves here though. Yeah. No, I mean, in the mountains. I'm, that's what I'm saying. And, uh, like those old tree growths with the big hollows in oh, them, which we've sense. cut yeah. most of those down. Yeah. So we take away their habitat and then we build these big artificial caves with the gable vents that are pretty much bat boxes. So, so you get to the source, you remove the animal. Mm -hmm. And so what's that range of cost? Sure, sure. So with the exclusion work, which that's the ceiling this of will the be house. Squirrel. We'll start with squirrel. Okay. Yeah. And it's pretty much the same because. I feel like bats, though, could be a lot more work because there's probably more of them. Probably more, less. I, so, know, I feel like bats would be less work than squirrels. It depends. Uh, like, so with bats, since they can fit through such tighter gaps, sometimes that's more stuff we have to seal. Bats, usually a colony starts out around 12 for brown bats and goes to about 40. Dang, they have, have you done 40? Oh, yeah, I've done way more than 40. What's your most that you remove? So free tail bats are, so brown bats stay year round in our area. Free tail bats migrate to South to Central America. They're called Mexican free tail bats, but they go all over. Fun fact for you. Have you ever looked at a Bacardi bottle? It has a bat on it. Oh, we were that? in Bacardi. Or I was in Bacardi. In yeah. Puerto Rico. Yeah. yeah, we went to the Bacardi factory. So that that bat on the bottle is a free tail bat, not because it's like oh, they're anatomically cool. yeah. gone. But if those bats don't go to their sugar cane fields, they lose most of their crop to it insects as well as the bats themselves pollinate the crop. interesting. So, so they welcome them. Yeah. Mm. But we get them here too. The free tail bats are the ones that you see like fly out in a fog. So they, they, that's a lot of them. They'll pack so tight in that gable vent you can't see daylight out of it sometimes. How do you catch all them? So we don't catch them. Once we're, we locate the areas that they could fit into that they aren't currently using first. Seal all those up first. And then we put in what's called a bat valve. And that's just a fancy term for like a one-way door. 
the bats. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so the bats have to fly out to feed. Do we need a few warmer nights? The insects are out to promote them to leave to feed. When they fly out to feed and they come back, they can't figure out how to get back in. So then they go to the neighbor's house and the neighbor calls you. That can happen sometimes. <laughs> so that's why it's important that we seal up everything leave else on the house Leave a sign in the yard. I'll give you a discount. Leave my sign in the yard for 30 days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously you would hope that they go to a natural habitat, but we can't physically remove the bats from Do you that. ever recommend like bat boxes outside? I usually tell people to treat them like hummingbird feeders. Like it's complete hobby. The bats are going to stay around. We had bats in our last house mm -hmm. and then our neighbor called us and he was like, oh, we've got bats. And then our other neighbor had a log cabin that was full of bats. We still saw our bats every night and they, they stay around, but the bat houses, you could get some bats staying there, could not, um, but it's not going to make it or break it, whether you keep your bats and it's definitely not going to get the bats out of your but house. it will like help with bugs, right? Yeah. My yeah. brother-in-law and sister do this. Yeah. I would love a bat yeah, box. Keep, keep all those. I don't actually, mind them flying around me if they're not in my house. As much as I go to jobs that have houses that have bats, they're actually kind of picky. On where they go so those boxes usually need to be at least 12 feet high okay so um, i definitely don't recommend putting them on your house i've seen oh, people do that no. before That's i've seen crazy. it i've seen it done before woods. yeah because yeah. um but in another aspect of the cost of that is so we talked about you know a dozen to 40 to hundreds if you got free tails they eat about half their body weight in insects every night that's a lot of droppings that goes along with that oh yeah so you know, if, if somebody's had a full colony of bats for just a few months, I'll see the guano, which is bat droppings, at three or four louvers high in that Can gable you vent. Clean that. Yes, and there is a so the droppings themselves aren't necessarily more toxic than any other animal dropping. You can actually buy it in bags as fertilizer. It makes great fertilizer, mm. but when it sits and it dries. It has a fungus that grows in it, and that fungus has a spore. Okay, I feel like mm. I've sort of heard this years ago, but that makes complete sense to me yeah so it causes something called histoplasmosis that so if you've ever heard of somebody being like bat poop crazy that's yeah. where that's from the people that work oh. like in the church like bell towers Can and stuff you like treat that or once yeah. you get it it's a problem so it depends on your overall health like anything else if you're generally healthy young it may not it may be completely asymptomatic you may have some flu-like symptoms for a couple of days or... So your body could naturally... Yes. It, the biggest risk it. is for elderly. Yeah, um, immunocompromised. Yes, correct. Children? Young children, yes, or mm -hmm. people with, you know, uh, weak immune systems, for sure. It can have all kinds of weird pulmonary and neurological issues. Wow. And I bet it's hard for doctors to kind of connect that because that's not probably a questionnaire. Like, have you been around bat droppings? I have dried for an extended period of time. I mean, unless you mention a bat problem being in an attic or something like that. So you probably have to be wary of being yeah. around that. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a proper way to treat it and remove it. And that's that's the biggest thing. You know, Do you wet it? Yes, you have to wet it to keep that spore from spreading. It's definitely not it's like asbestos then or, you know, like it's not a as, biohazard. Yeah, it's it's not as bad as that. The biggest thing is when you move it. So if if somebody has like a bunch of droppings up there and they go up there with just a vacuum cleaner and vacuum it up dry. That's that's not going to be good. You're just spreading that spore all over. So, yeah, I usually wet it down with a hospital grade disinfectant viricide that has a fungicide in it. How many hours is this process from, you know, whether it's squirrels to bats? What's the range of time? So for bats, it depends on the time of year. When it's colder like this, those warmer nights are harder to come by. Mm -hmm. So it, I have to leave those valves in place longer. So but what are the man hours for you for range wise? Yeah, depends on the job. Most of the time, I would say on average, we've got about four to eight hours on the front end of doing the exclusion of work of sealing. One multiple people. That would be for one person. Okay. If we've got multiple people, yeah. you know, we can obviously make that go a little faster. Then we get the valves in place. Once we had enough time that we feel confident and they're gone and can verify them. they're okay. gone. Yeah. We can pull the valves and do that final sealing. At that point, we would do the cleanup on the end. So depending on how much cleanup there is and how many valves we have to put in place, you know, we have another three to four hours on the back end. So it varies there. But back to your cost question, I would say most of our bat work starts between six and $700. Mm -hmm. And that 80% or more falls under $1,800. Okay. And then occasionally we have houses that have... Like an extreme case. Yeah. It's a common situation where it 
goes above and beyond that is, you know, they have a construction gap above the gutter that goes all the way around the house mm. and we're having to seal that. That's, that ends up adding, adding up pretty quick. So occasionally we get some jobs, you know, that end up being twenty four, twenty six hundred dollars. I mean, that seems, I mean, yeah. And your what's health we, and your sanity and not hearing noises in your attic at night and thinking it's haunted. Yeah. Definitely. That would be a really good. Mm-hmm. Correct. I mean, that's a good use of your money. You might have to not drink Starbucks for a little bit, but it's not crazy to me for the amount of work that you do. Yeah. And people don't want to have a bat that somehow gets in their living space and could potentially give them rabies. And, you know, you don't know if it's biting you, which is a kind of a alarming thing. But right. <laughs> I, I try not to, I try not to scare people. And that's I feel like it's so easy to do in this industry is to just like fear monger, you know, like just oh, this animal is going to come and kill your children or, you know, yeah. it will turn into Dracula. You know, <laughs> I, I give people that information. I kind of gave my little public service announcement just because I do get that call so much. And it's sad to me, like, oh, man, if we could have just if they would have just known the right process of how to take care of that bat that was in the living space, they could have just got the bat tested. And now we don't have to get rabies shots. So, yeah, so that's the reason so why I say call that. you. How do people find you? Sure. So you can find us at wildsciencesolutions.com. You can call us directly at 919-557-8000. What areas do you work? We're based out of Holly Springs, but we do most of the triangle. So, What's the furthest you'll go? It depends on the job. If it's some, something like squirrels where we have to be there regularly checking the traps, I can't you know, drive out an hour and a half to every day to check squirrels. It's not going to be so maybe cost Maybe an hour of Holly Springs? Yeah, I would say within 50 miles of Holly Springs okay. is usually. So pretty big if, range if it's mm-hmm. something like bats where we're going to be there doing you know majority of work in the day and then just having to come back for that second visit we'll go a little bit farther for for bats but animals that you know if there's need continuous follow-ups then it's not always a cost effective for the customer to pay us to come out and drive that far but no do wake forest chapel hill holly springs the majority of our work is definitely in holly springs fuquay mm-hmm. Cary, apex but do work in garner Sanford, gone that far out. Has there ever been a job, not that your license didn't cover it, and we're not talking about feral cats, where it was just such a big job that you had to, you just could not do it or you refused to do it, like something insane? So it's not so much the animal issue is sometimes the house is just not in the condition that like tons of wood rot where they would need a contractor yeah, to yeah, actually fix they need that. A, they need a lot of you work. You can't foam those gaps. Exactly. If if I feel like I'm in a situation where like, you know, if there's something temporary, like, okay, hey, I'm going to temporarily patch this spot and that's going to hold you over till you can get that fixed. I'll absolutely take care of that. But there's some where it's like, you don't have a fascia board. Like there's nothing I can do yeah. for you. Like it's just, you know, need a lot of work it's like done. people that don't close their crawl spaces, sometimes the doors rot. And then you have that open space. And not that you can't handle something like that, but it's one of those things where it's wide open. Yeah. Not even barely. You know, we have, my office is 1935. And before I knew you, we had a couple squirrels that got in because we had rot in our office. But our vent for our crawl space are actually, they're really pretty. They've got a cool design, but the gap is Mm -hmm. much larger than it should be. And I'm actually thinking about it. I don't know if, if we put a mesh over that we probably should have so i'm gonna go to the office and stick my fingers in our because we knew that would be a problem because my father my father goes i saw a bunny go into the crawl space of the office do you remember this yeah. and he goes and i think he had no bones because he just stuck his head in there and he just like folded his body and went into Aww. there and i died laughing i was like dad you know it had bones he was like it was just funny. contorting he was like i just can't believe <laughs> i like, just can't believe it did that one of those jelly easter bunny yeah, he was like, and i think it was a juvenile but yeah he was like it just seemed like it had no bones and i'm like oh well that's when i was like well if our rabbits can get in our crawl space snakes mm. and something else and who knows what and mice now, when we have that closed off, if we don't have a problem, then it's probably unlikely. What kind of meshing do you recommend people like a metal, like a metal mesh? Because I feel like any animal could do like your screened in porch mesh. Material. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like the bug screening, not enough. And uh, even metals, depending on how they're installed, like if if a rodent can get their teeth on it, they can pry it back pretty good. Usually uh, the industry standard for a lot of that stuff is quarter inch hardware cloth. So it's the quarter inch pow- pattern, square patterned hardware cloth, like metal screen. 
usually that does it for foundation vents. We'll use something like that. We'll paint it black and put it over it or a metal lath, depending on the type of vent it is. But going back to your point there, I just wanted to mention, like, obviously I know what you guys do and know about your company. I see that frequently where, you know, I know when we were buying our first house, it was don't really think about what a realtor does. Like you're like, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, they should, they unlock doors for us. And then, you know, they help with the paperwork and you know, they just assist you through the way. But I've seen so many situations where somebody just moved into the house and they're like, oh, I think we have an issue. And I get out there, I'll give you an example. I came to one house and there were dead birds in the fly, in the fireplace. They had a hole in the side, yeah. in their siding about this big for squirrels that gnawed in. They had their yeah. attic, had that foamed in insulation, the poly something yeah. insulation, which is expensive, but flying squirrels had gnawed holes through it and bats were coming in through that. They oh had gosh. an open air duct. So they, you know, had the did third they get floor. a home inspection done. They did get a home inspection done, but it's stuff like, you know, seeing if everything goes smooth, yeah, great. The realtor, you know, was there through the process, but it's when I see things that like it's the difference to me between a good realtor and a not so experienced realtor is, okay, do you have the resources when there is an issue? Do you have reputable We're people? Pointing out when you review yeah. the oh, home yeah. inspection report that, hey, this could be a major issue and let's get some pricing and have some professionals out to evaluate it, whether or not you're going to ask for these repairs so that you're not blindsided. Because yeah. I'm assuming those people were blindsided because oh, that's a no lot clue. of work. Yeah, they had no clue. And not only that, they had put new gutters and new shingles on top of rotten wow. firewood and rotten fascia. So it's just literally lipstick the house, you know, wow. so it looked good. And so nobody had really taken a good look at that house. And I'm talking, you know, my work there was $1,900, mm -hmm. but the amount of work to fix all the stuff that was there, I mean. The, thousands. Yeah, tens of thousands of what? dollars. Are yeah. you like that? Wow. I mean, the roof had to be completely redone. Oh. And it had brand new shingles on it, which is the sad thing oh, about that. You know? awful. So Ugh. to me, I think I've you know, noticed that from just dealing with realtors and dealing with people that call me either somebody's about to buy the house or they just bought it or somebody's about to sell their house. Seeing how the realtor handles that process, you know, I feel like that's where you're getting your bang for your buck. Like if something goes wrong, you know, they have the experience, they have the resources to make yeah. that as seamless yeah, as possible. Absolutely. I mean, so. and that's the whole thing is real estate agents, even though we don't necessarily have firsthand knowledge and experience with some of the things that we talked about, we know enough that we need to call professionals if we don't know about something. Yeah. And it's better to err on the side of caution and do your due diligence and your research and advocate for your client rather than just take the easy route or be totally unaware of what's going on by reading reports and thinking about the fact that certain things that may not look that scary could be an onion. And without somebody's opinion before they close could be a totally crazy scenario. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come. We'll probably have to have you on again at some point. That'd be awesome. Thanks for having and me. And I think the next time that we do this, we should talk about it's either going to be Puerto Rico or Frying Pan Tower. Yeah, and we're having a home inspector come. Yes, we're yeah. going to have a home inspector. And that's going to be the other side of what you're talking mm -hmm. about, what they see. And so it kind of connects everything together. So I appreciate your time. I hope that anybody listening to this uses you for those services. And if they don't know who to use, you have a list of recommended vendors for any situation that they may have that's animal related. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Tar Life Podcast with top producing mega agent, Erica Anderson. If you've enjoyed this episode or found the content to be useful or fun, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Visit our website at www.teamandersonrealty.com. We are actively serving the Triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, and the coastal regions of North Carolina. If you're looking to sell a home, please contact Team Anderson Realty to set up an in-person or virtual consultation today.